<laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And when we start here in a second, after uh, reintroduction, introduction, uh, we're going to be starting in Mark 1, verse uh, 35, is where we left off last time. So, and welcome guests <laughs> and new folks. Um, so, um, we spent about half the time last time introducing the Gospel of Mark, so I'm not going to go back through all of that again. Um, as usual, if you go to the cathedral website, you've got all the past Bible studies pretty much posted there. Uh, to listen to be grown on and on there, to your heart's content. Uh, but uh, for tonight, just to go back a little bit, get us caught back up uh, to where we were in terms of the... Uh, terms of the text. Uh, we reiterated last time that the actual title of this book is not Mark, but the gospel according to Mark. And the reason that's important is, that, as we said last time, we tend to talk about gospels, plural, right? Like there are four gospels of the Bible, but the reality is there's only one gospel, right? There's only one Christ. He came once, he did one thing, he died and rose once. There's one gospel, but we have that gospel according to four different witnesses, right? We have four different sets of testimony to what, to what it is that Jesus did. Okay, so this is, now we've already gone through the gospel according to St. Matthew, now we're talking about the gospel according to uh, St. Mark. And we talked about the fact that uh, the Gospel of Mark is uh, generally considered to be the first of the four that was written uh, chronologically. Uh, a lot of people date it to around 69 AD. Uh, we made the comment last time that according to traditional dating, uh, St. Mark died in 68, which would make that difficult. So <laughs> that's probably sometime at the end of St. Mark's life between 64 and 68 is probably actually when he would have put pen to paper uh, in terms of when the gospel started circulating 69, you know, maybe right. But the important part is that it was in the late 60s. It was after uh, St. Peter had been executed by Nero uh, because St. Mark is recording, basic, essentially recording as he had followed St. Peter in his preaching. He's recording St. Peter's testimony, St. Peter being the eyewitness. Uh, Mark is recording his preaching and his testimony to who Jesus was after St. Peter's death. So in that window between St. Peter's death and his own death is when this would have been composed in writing. Uh, we talked about the fact that uh, Mark's name, he actually is referred to in the book of Acts as John Mark, that... Uh, that's not like a first name, last name, or a first name, middle name, because they didn't have first and last names in the first century, but that John would have been his given Jewish name. The, the uh, Greek name, Ioannes, is actually derived from Jonah in the Old Testament. Uh, so this would have been his given Hebrew name, uh, but it was very common for Jewish residents of different parts of the Roman Empire to also have a Greek or a Latin name that they used when they conducted business uh, in the Roman world. And so Marcus is actually a Latin name. So the Mark comes from Marcus. In the same way that uh, St. Paul's uh, Jewish given name was Saul, but he had the name Paulos, the Greek name Paulos that he used sort of uh, in public uh, him being from Tarsus, uh, we talked about the fact that Mark is from uh, originally Cyrene, which is in North Africa and what's now Libya, uh, where there was actually a very large Jewish community in the first century. It's long gone now, <laughs> but in the first century, uh, in Roman North Africa, there was a large Jewish community there. Uh, and we talked about how he ended up back in North Africa, and that is probably the place from which he is writing his gospel. Uh, after St. Peter's death, he left Rome and went to Alexandria in Egypt. 
and that that is most likely the place from which he is writing. And then finally we talked about, and my lovely art uh, display here, <laughs> uh, the fact that tr traditionally uh, the church fathers have uh, identified the four gospels with uh, the heads of the four living creatures in Ezekiel in terms of connecting them to different themes and this which is supposed to be the lion head <laughs> the lion is the one that's traditionally associated with with the gospel according to St. Mark uh, and that is because as we talked about last time uh, Christ is portrayed as the line of the tribe of Judah, meaning particularly in terms of his kingship. Right? Jesus is presented particularly here uh, as, as being the Messiah, being the king of the Jews who has come. And we talked about here at the beginning of the gospel, that's part of the reason why St. Mark doesn't describe Jesus' birth. Right? In, in the Gospel according to St. Matthew and the Gospel according to St. Luke, as we'll see, Next, they both go into some detail about the circumstances and place and everything of Jesus' birth. Jesus just sort of shows up. <laughs> it's St. Mark's Gospel. St. John the Forerunner is baptizing people in the Jordan River, and Jesus just sort of shows up one day. Well, that's because, uh, as we saw last time, the way that St. Mark describes Jesus' baptism in particular is as an anointing as king. And so... St. Mark's Gospel essentially begins not with Jesus' birth, but with his sort of coronation. And as we saw way back in the long ago time in the Old Testament, <laughs> so we were talking about David. David, was, remember, was anointed by the prophet Samuel a long time before he sat on a throne. Right? A lot of the story of David was what transpired, the persecution at the hands of Saul, and running from place to place, and his various scholarships, on the way to him finally receiving his throne and so we talked about last time from that beginning how St. Mark's gospel sort of follows a similar pattern to that. Jesus is anointed with the Holy Spirit here at the very beginning very beginning of his ministry declared sort of publicly to be the Messiah to be the king now the rest of the gospel is going to be sort of him the pathway to him taking his taking his throne yeah. that's basically where we left off where we left off last time. Uh, are there any questions about that before I go any further? Anybody have anything? Else? Sure. Oh, what? My beautiful art isn't. Well, no, <laughs> I don't know. Man. Yeah, there's. It's a, it's an ox, an ox, a human, and an eagle. And the ox is usually associated with Saint Matthew because Saint Matthew focuses on Christ's sufferings. Uh, and uh, the human face is usually associated with St. Luke because St. Luke uh, focuses on Christ's humanity and John is usually so this is supposed to be an eagle not a pigeon uh, <laughs> um, and uh, that's usually associated with St. John's gospel because St. John's gospel is sort of the theological gospel where right, it sort of soars above <laughs> um, so yeah those are the other three Association, and we we talked about last time how you'll see in iconography of Saint Mark you'll see lions or lion faces or that sort of thing. Um, City of Venice, even we talked about, has a big lion on their flag because Saint Mark's Cathedral is right in the center of right in the center of Venice. Um, so that that iconography is common, including on the actually on the front of the church. If you go outside the front door, um, there are four tiles that have much better art than that. But <laughs> the ox and the lion and the, the eagle and the, and the human face. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to go over before we get started uh, is, because this is going to be relevant to, it's already a little relevant to what we read last week, it's going to become increasingly relevant as we go, and that's a little bit of uh, geography, so I'm going to draw a horrible map. What that means. Um, but of the area we're talking about. So there's my suitably horrible. <laughs> this being supposed to be the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, the River Jordan, the Dead Sea, 
Mediterranean Sea coast over here. Okay, so just some rough geography. Because we're going to be talking uh, tonight, especially a lot about Galilee. So there are actually in this area at this point in time under the Romans, right? If we call this whole area Roman Palestine in the first century. Uh, there is the Roman province of Judea, which is roughly here. There's the Roman province of Samaria, which is roughly here. And then there's the Roman province of Galilee that's right here. So Galilee in the north. Actually, Samaria is right over on the other side of the joint. Samaria in the middle. And then Judea down here. And we tend to Jerusalem's right about there. Uh, we tend to talk about uh, this area as just being Judea. Right? It's just being Judea. Um, but technically speaking, these are three separate areas. And in the first century, politically, they were three separate areas. Uh, historically, remember we, we read at the end of the Old Testament about how under the Persians, at the very end of the 6th century B.C., so the flat, early 500s B.C., uh, the Jewish people who had been in exile in Babylon were allowed to return and set up Judea. And then later on, under the Greeks, when they were being oppressed by Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, the Greek dictator, uh, the Maccabean revolt happened. It's recorded in the books of the Maccabees, where they rose up, and Judea became independent briefly. <laughs> it was an independent Judea. Part of the way they stayed independent, remember, is that they made treaties with other people to protect them against the Greeks coming back in. One of those was the Romans, which then allowed the Romans to come in and annex them a few centuries later. Uh, but so, from around uh, 175 to around uh, 70 BC or so, Judea was largely independent. Uh, during that time, the, uh, the kings who are descended from the Maccabees are referred to as the Hasmoneans. And that Hasmonean dynasty, around 150 BC, had a very important person in it named John Hyrcanus. John Hyrcanus was, even though you're not supposed to remember we read in the Old Testament they were very strict about this, he was both the high priest and the king. Which remember, they were very clear the Old Testament was never supposed to happen. But as we saw when the Maccabees gained their independence uh, Judas Maccabeus made his brother the high priest. <laughs> so thus the, both the priesthood and the monarchy ended up being in the same family. When we get to John Hyrcanus they end up in the same person. And John Hyrcanus not only was the high priest and the king, but he decided uh, he never officially declared himself the Messiah. But he did a lot of things <laughs> from the Old Testament to kind of indicate that maybe he thought he was sort of hoping other people would latch on to it. And one of those things was, one of the things they believed, remember, is that the Messiah would reunite the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, the northern 10 tribes had been pretty much wiped out by the Assyrians, but there were people living in these lands, right? in, in Samaria and, and Galilee. And so John Hyrcanus conquered them. So under John Hyrcanus, this became sort of one, this whole area of Palestine was united under one Judean government from Jerusalem. Uh, when he did that, when he conquered Samaria, for example, he destroyed the Samaritan's temple. Because he said, right, the Pentateuch's clear, you're only supposed to worship God in one place, that's the temple of Jerusalem, so we're going to wipe out your temple. <laughs> that's one of the reasons why, as we've already seen a little bit in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, and as we'll continue to see the Gospel, the, the, the Judeans and the Samaritans don't like each other. <laughs> This is part of that bad history. Right? The, 
Judeans came in and conquered them and destroyed their temple. They also conquered this region here around the Sea of Galilee that would later become Galilee. Well, the Romans, after they took over, broke this up. Broke it up again into separate pieces. And in fact, after Herod the Great died in uh, around uh, 4 BC, after Herod the Great died, they split this country up between his four sons, which is why his four sons were called tetrarchs. They were rulers of a fourth. Okay. So one of his sons was put over Galilee, one was put over Samaria, one was put over Judea, right, because the Romans didn't want anyone other than themselves having too much power at any given point in time. Right? So keep it, keep it broken up, keep people fighting amongst themselves, jockeying for position, then you don't have to worry about them rising up against the Romans. And we saw this reflected a little bit at the beginning of, of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Remember, Herod has all the infants killed. Right? Herod the Great has all the infants killed to try to stop the Messiah from coming. And uh, Joseph and, and the Theotokos and Jesus flee to Egypt. Right? And then when they hear that Herod is dead, they came back. Right? But when they found out that his son it was really Judea, they didn't stay, they went back up to Galilee where his other son was, was ruling, but where there was a more sort of conducive <laughs> environment. They were out, of the, out from under his thumb because this had been broken up. And we saw that play out a little later too in the gospel when, remember, Jesus' ministry was mostly up here in Galilee. Right? And most of his opposition, the Pharisees, we'd hear Pharisees came from Judea, right? came up to give him trouble. Right? And it was when he came down to travel down to Jerusalem that he ends up being arrested and executed because there, centered around the temple, is where the Judeans had power. So in Galilee, sometimes referred to as Galilee of the Gentiles, it was primarily Jewish ethnically, but there were also lots of Greeks, lots of Romans, lots of other people. There's a lot of trade. Um, you would find Jewish synagogues and pagan temples both scattered around uh, so there's a little more ideological freedom right? Jesus could travel and preach a little more and not be in danger of imminent death here in Galilee but as he, as he travels down toward Judea it's a whole different story because that's where Herod is in power that's where the seat of the Roman government is that's where the temple is where the high priests have control so I wanted to go over that just sort of, at least quickly, so that as we're talking about Galilee, because there's going to be a lot of stuff about Judeans and Galilee, and this kind of thing coming up here. So just so you know what they're talking about. Yeah. Was there a reason for making Galilee separate other than to just give territory to one of the sons? Or was it just because, you, did you say there was that mix there as opposed to what? Yeah, it was, it was primarily to weaken, because the, the, the Sadducees and the high priests who are still in control of the temple here, were the descendants of John Hyrcanus and that line. Uh, that's one of the reasons why Herod the Great was appointed ethnarch in the first place, was, see, the Romans already were trying to pull apart, okay, we'll, we'll prop up a monarchy here, separate from the priesthood over here, trying to divide things up. Um, so a lot of it was that was to weaken that sort of central power coming from the temple uh, because uh, that was troublesome for Rome the whole time <laughs> I mean the instant they took over there was constant tension and there were flare-ups um, in the in the 40s uh, Caligula tried to put a statue of himself <laughs> in the Jewish temple and it looked like it was about to start a revolt uh, then he got killed so <laughs> the problem kind of went away uh, but then ultimately in 70 AD when the Jewish revolt happens, right, the Romans come and destroy the temple as their way of, right, that's why they destroy the temple at that point. Because the temple was sort of the power base then for the, for the Jewish people, the Judeans. And so by destroying the temple, you wipe out the hub of their power. Um, if you could deal with them sort of scattered, right, that's one thing. You get them together you know, with, with religion behind it, that kind of thing. That's when the Romans started having trouble. 
what's west of the Samaria in uh, Galilee? Uh, these are mostly Gentile towns on the seacoast. Um, Tyre got rebuilt. It's about there. You know, in what's now Lebanon. <laughs> you know. it, it's all Roman territory. Yeah. There's another province here, Maritima, it's called. That's because it's, it's where we get the word maritime, <laughs> right? Referring to the sea. Um, so, but there's not, at this point in history, there's not a significant Jewish population along this part of the coast. And like I said, Galilee's mixed, and the Samaritans are the Samaritans who are ethnically mixed as a people. Um, recent DNA testing has shown that there are, they are actually descended from the Jews. <laughs> there is actually Jews, but it's not pure. So they're, they're ethnically mixed, which is another part of why there was a problem between the Judeans and the Samaritans. Okay, so that sort of background stuff behind us. Uh, Mark 1, verse 35. And so we're just coming off of, because it's going to start with now in the morning, <laughs> right? we're just coming off of Jesus, after he's been baptized, has called his first disciples, who, are, who were all fishermen, who he called from here along the seacoast. And then he was in Capernaum, which is sort of the largest city it was actually built by Herod the Great, uh, the largest city on the seacoast of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Jesus went there, he healed St. Peter's mother-in-law. You can insert your mother-in-law joke there. Uh, he healed St. Peter's mother-in-law, and then he uh, has been casting out demons and healing the sick uh, side by side. So after, after these healings, now, now we're going to in the morning. <laughs> Verse 35, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. And Simon, those who were with him, searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. Yeah. So, we see again, this is now the second time Jesus has sort of gone off by himself. And we're all still in chapter 1. <laughs> Remember, uh, after his baptism, he went out into the desert and St. Mark just says he was tempted by the devil. We don't get the detailed sort of description like we got in Gospel of St. Matthew. Just he went for 40 days in the desert by himself. He was tempted by the devil and then he came back and began his ministering. Now sort of in the midst of this ministering, he sort of disappears off by himself again. <laughs> Right, spent time by himself uh, in prayer. Uh, we also saw, remember last time already, uh, he went into the synagogue in Capernaum and was preaching there, and there was a demon-possessed man there who he cast a demon out of. Uh, the demon sort of identified him as being the Messiah. And remember, it said that he wouldn't let the demon speak any further. Right? He sort of swore everyone to secrecy right, about him being the Messiah. So this is more of that theme which we mentioned it at least last time. In the Gospel according to St. Mark, Jesus is sort of very secretive. Uh, he doesn't just come out, you know, and say, oh, by the way, I'm the Messiah, everybody. Right? In fact, he swears people to secrecy who figure out he's the Messiah, he tells them, don't tell anybody. Right? Don't tell anybody. So, we see between the, the, the fact of how secretive he is and where he's ministering, right? He's traveling all around through Galilee, but staying in Galilee, right? going, and going to the synagogues. Right? He's not going out in public. Remember, in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, Jesus gives right, almost right off the bat, chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Right? He just goes out in public. He just goes up on top of a hill, preaches for everybody to hear. Right? St. Mark's Gospel... It's a little different. It's a little different. He's not just going out preaching for everybody to hear. He's staying in the synagogues. He's staying in Galilee. And he's being kind of secretive, at least here at the beginning. Which is sort of anticipating, again, why would he be being so secretive? Well, <laughs> in, 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 uh, once they get word of this down in Judea, 
right? there's, there's potential problems. So St. Mark is kind of telegraphing where this is going, right? That, that once certain parties find out about what's going on, there's going to be a conflict coming. Okay, verse 40, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. So a couple things here. First, as we talked about the Gospel according to St. Matthew, uh, leprosy in the first century here in this part of the world is most likely what's called Hansen's disease, which is uh, a wasting condition of the flesh. Right? We're essentially uh, starting at people's extremities, noses, ears, fingers, toes, uh, the flesh starts to die, just becomes necrotic. And so you end up losing your fingers you have to amputate, losing your fingers, losing your toes, losing your nose, losing your ears. Um, it's progressive. There was no cure for it at the time. There's no way to treat it whatsoever. Um, and uh, they weren't sure how it was spread entirely at this point in history. Uh, and so if you contracted it, and were known to have contracted it, you were thrown out of the cities. You had to go and live just out in the countryside in the, in the caves. And you were required on punishment of death if anyone came within uh, eyesight of you to announce yourself as being unclean. Right? Call it, say that you were unclean so that they would not, they know not to come near you. Unless they contracted it. And of course, as people, as the disease progressed, people looked sort of less and less human. You know? um, and most of these lepers, before the disease actually killed them, would have starved to death or or died of exposure uh, because they had nobody to, nobody to take care of them out in the wilderness. So this person with leprosy, right off the bat, even before he says anything, is showing a pretty huge amount of faith in that he approaches Jesus. <laughs> the fact that he comes up to Jesus, I mean, he, he could have been executed for that. Right? He could have been executed for that. For, for coming in, coming that close to good, good and and righteous people, right? and potentially spreading his disease to them, but he approaches Jesus boldly and unapologetically. It says to him, "If you are willing, you can make me clean," right. which is quite the quite the statement, right? quite the statement, because again, there's no known cure for this. So the fact that he identifies in Jesus, if you want to, <laughs> right? If you want to, you have the power to cure me of this, right? It is a huge statement in terms of who he believes Jesus is. There, there are only a, a couple of cases, <laughs> right, in the Old Testament, even of a leper being cleansed. Uh, remember, in, in Kings Elisha, said Naaman the leper. He had to do this whole process. He had to go and bathe in this pool and in the river and <laughs> do all these things. And then eventually, ultimately, he was, he was cleansed. Right? And remember, one of the signs that God gave Moses to show to Pharaoh was that he put his hand into his, he pulled it out, and it was leprous, and he put it into his, okay, and pulled it out, and it was clean. Right? So the idea here is, from the Old Testament, only God really has the power <coughs> to do this. So this man is at least saying that he's accepted that Jesus is the Messiah. Right? That Jesus has the power of God. Right? Minimally. <laughs> right? Minimally he's saying that by approaching him and saying this to him. And because he's, again, he's not saying, I know that if you tell me to do something and I go to, like with Naaman, <laughs> right? Like he, I think you're a prophet like Elijah. He's saying, if you want to, right, boom, you can cure me. So he's saying he knows that Christ is more powerful than Moses. 
right? Because that was a sign given to Moses and more powerful than Elisha. And then, of course, Jesus does it, right? Jesus not only does it, but he's moved with compassion. He stretched out his hand and he touched him. Right? He touched him, which is, of course, something that no one ever would have done, right? Because this man's unclean. This man's unclean. You could contract the illness yourself. Bare minimum, even if you didn't contract the illness, you're now unclean. You have to go through this whole ritual before you can walk into a synagogue or or walk into a Jewish person's house, right? Because the normal process is, right, from the Torah, from the law in the Old Testament is, you touch something unclean, you become unclean. We see with Jesus, this is reversed, right? Jesus reaches out and touches this man, and the man becomes clean. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. So he becomes clean, what does this man have to do in order to re-enter society now? Right? It's not just, oh good, I'm cured, I can go back to my job. <laughs> Doesn't have a job, right? Doesn't have, this is, he's cured. What he has to do is he has to go and show himself to the priest so that the priest can verify that he doesn't have leprosy. This again gives you a window. Where are the priests? They're down here in Jerusalem, right? Not in Galilee. Right? And they're the only ones who have the authority to let this man back into society. And so again, you see a window of the power that they're wielding, that he has to go and do this uh, in order to be able to, to come back in. They did. Yeah, he's, Jesus has been preaching. No No. No, the synagogues, there's, there's nothing in the Old Testament telling them to build synagogues, right? <laughs> in fact, the, the, the Old Testament, again and again, is very strict. The only place you're supposed to worship God is the temple in Jerusalem. Okay. That's it. But the reality is, as we saw, when the Assyrians destroyed Israel and the Babylonians destroyed Judah and took the people of Judah into captivity, remember some of them fled to Egypt, some of them stayed in the land, some of them ended up going to Babylon. Well, after that, when the Persians let them return, some of them returned to Judea, some of them who were in Egypt stayed in Egypt. Some of them stayed in Babylon, right, where they were. They didn't want to come back. And then as, you know, the, we go through the centuries in the Greek empires and then the Roman Empire, Jews spread all over, Jewish Judean extraction spread all over the world. Well, this created a problem, right? I'm a Judean person. I worship the God of Israel. I worship Yahweh, right? I'm not going to go and become a pagan. Right? I'm not going to worship these pagan gods because I've been told I'm not supposed to. But I live in Rome. <laughs> right? Or I live in, in uh, Cyrene, you know, in northern Africa. Where I live. You know, I'm hundreds of miles away. I'll probably never see the temple in my life. Right? Maybe once. Maybe once if I save up my whole life, I'll be able to take a pilgrimage there. But pro- I'm not going to be going there weekly. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Well, what do I do? You know, I try and follow the Old Testament laws, I guess, but do I just not worship God? Do I mail money to some relative in, <laughs> in Jerusalem and ask them to make sacrifices for me? I mean, what do I do? Well, the, the synagogues were sort of an accommodation for that. The word synagogue just from the Greek word for a gathering place where you gather together. And so they would just buy these places for the, people, the Judean people Judean community in that city to come and gather together and they'd pray together and read the scriptures together. But it's, it was just sort of an accommodation to what happened. You know, so that they would have a place to pray and worship. And it was as much, you know, we, we're modern Americans. So we have bred into a sort of the separation of church and state and stuff. So we think of religion sort of as its own sort of category here. But remember, at this point in history, those things aren't separate. Right? Your culture, your religion, your politics, all that stuff is all just one thing. It's all just part of your identity. Right? So synagogues were religious centers, cultural centers, right? the, the whole shot right? for the people. Um, sort of in the way that a lot of Orthodox churches in this country became for immigrant groups. You know, they weren't, quote unquote, just a church. <laughs> right, where they went on Sunday, it was also the place where the community gathered 
you know, the people where everybody spoke the same language, the people where they all understood and shared the same culture. Right? So the same kind of thing with the synagogues. They became those gathering places for all the various people from Judea scattered all over the world. And so they're even up here in Galilee. Right? Because realistically, if you're a peasant at this time in history, you're working land you don't own your whole life. <laughs> you're lucky if you have one or two meals a day fairly consistently. You're not making a lot of trips to Jerusalem. <laughs> right? Even if even this little distance at that time, I mean, you're going on foot if you do. So again, maybe once or twice in your life you might go there. So on a, on a day-to-day basis when you're gathering together to pray on the Sabbath and, and read the scriptures, you're going to a synagogue in your hometown. It's down the street. Yeah. And so those are the places where Jesus, as we just read, is going around and preaching. Right? He's going to the Judean people here. He's not going out into the market and just addressing everybody. Right? He's definitely not going into the pagan temples and addressing anybody. Right? But he's going specifically to the, to the synagogues. So he tells them to go to the priest right, so he can re-enter society. But he says, other than that, don't tell anybody. And of course, immediately the guy goes and tells everybody. <laughs> right? And so it gets to the point where it says Jesus can't go into the cities. Right? That's, there, there's sort of two reasons for that. Number one is, that he, says St. Mark is suggesting popularity. He's getting mobbed when he goes into the cities by sick people. <laughs> you know, by people abroad. Because his reputation is spread. But also, his reputation is spread. And the cities are the places where you're more likely to run into the Pharisees from Judea. The other people who might have a problem with, with what Jesus is doing. And so now, because of this... Right? This is that dynamic again. Because there's this resistance, now Jesus is having to stay. He can't really go around to the cities and the synagogues. He's having to stay out in the open places. Question in synagogues. Would you consider the synagogue in today's thinking a parish and then the temple, the cathedral? Because the cathedral would take care, or like if you will go to the Vatican, you have, this is the capital of the religious institution. They're really not parallel because they didn't do sacrifices in the synagogues. No, but they did at the temple. Only at the temple. Right? So the worship in the synagogues and the worship in the temple were two different kinds of worship. Right? Whereas if you go to a church in a cathedral, it's the same kind of worship. I mean, one might be bigger and more grandiose, right? more well attended, but the same basic thing is happening. Right? The divine liturgy is the divine liturgy. Right, or in Roman Catholic terms, right, the, the, the mass is the mass. Right. right, one may be more elaborate. Whereas this is, in one place you're doing the animal sacrifices and the whole liturgy involving that, and that's the focus of the worship. The other places you're doing no animal sacrifices. And it's prayers and scripture reading and, and, teaching. and, and, teach, and teaching. And so that, that they're very different in that regard that regard and that's part of what lets the Sadducees and the high priests who control the temple have so much power right? because under the, under the old covenant read the Torah the forgiveness of sins requires what? Sacrifices, sacrifices right? so they're the gatekeepers for that right? they've got themselves set up as the gatekeepers for salvation basically Right? If they tell you you're unclean and you can't come and offer sacrifices, right? <laughs> uh, so that that's a big difference between the two. Um, now, what's going to happen is after the temple's destroyed in 70 A.D., right? The 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 Judeans who don't become Christians are by and large going to shift over to the synagogue we have worshiping, which is why we have Jewish synagogues today. Right? Rabbinic Judaism just shifts over to that worship of the synagogue, because with no temple, they can't do the animal sacrifices. So they have to shift. And, then, and Christianity, of course, is going to say, because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, we don't need any more sacrifices, and that's why God allowed the temple to be destroyed, because it was now obsolete. Okay. 
So chapter 2, verse 1, relatedly. (laughs) And again, he entered Capernaum. So he says, after some days. So some time passes, right? Some time passes, he's able to come back into the city. And it was heard that he was in the house. So immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them. Not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Okay, so he waits a little while. He comes back into the city. But word gets out again that he's there. Everybody's packing in to try and try and see him. When he says he's in the house, that's not mid-80s slang. <laughs> he's, he's in that witch house, St. Peter's mother-in-law's house. Right? Remember, that's where he went with his disciples in chapter 1. So he's back. He's there at St. Peter's mother-in-law's house. Everybody hears. They're all packing in. We're told so many people are packed in, they can't even get like near the door, right? You can't even sort of peek around <laughs> the door and see him. Everybody's jammed in. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. So the roofs, the roofs on houses, at this point in Galilee, were essentially thatch roofs, right? So they have these sort of covers. They can't get in the door, so they climb up on the roof and start pulling apart. There's on the roof. They've got them on a stretcher, right, which would have just been two sticks with a cloth, you know, between it. And so they lure him down through the roof to where Jesus is, right? So this guy's at least got some dedicated friends, right? This poor paralyzed guy. Um, which again would have been why he survived. We've got to remember, at this point in history, Romans didn't have welfare, they didn't have disability, right? <laughs> they didn't have, right? If you were disabled, sorry, you can't work, so now you're totally useless to the Romans, right? <laughs> the only use they really had for the Judean people in the first place was, well, they worked the farms and get us our grain, right? And we can tax them. Well, if you can't work, <laughs> They have no use for you whatsoever. So they would happily just let disabled people die. Uh, so the fact that this guy has these four friends, right, is why he's still alive, is he has these four people who care about him and who are taking care of him. And they care about him so much and are, again, like the leper, so confident in who Jesus is that they go to these sort of extremes. You know, you might think, wouldn't they be mad that he just, like, wrecked the roof? Of, like, you know, but... They're bold enough that they know that he could do something for their friend. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. They're scribes. Where where are they from? Jerusalem. (laughs) These guys are trained in Jerusalem. We talked about how uh, most of the Pharisees and and, uh, teachers... And even the priests had been scribes, right? And scribal training was essentially from age 13 to about age 30. You sat in a room every day for as long as there was daylight copying the text of the Bible, right? While one person would read it, you'd have 30 or 40 of these scribes in training, all writing down copies, and that's how they made more copies of the scriptures. So there was no printing press for another 1,500 years. So by the time... These scribes had spent 17 years, 300, well, not 365 because of the Sabbaths, but 280 <laughs> days a year, um, 12 hours a day, probably on average. Copy this. They do the scriptures pretty well, right? <laughs> they've, they've dug them all over and over and over again. And that's why those who had been trained in this way were then the ones who had become teachers and Pharisees and, and ascend up into the, the temple hierarchy from there. So some of these folks with scribal training right, who are probably the teachers of the city, local synagogues and that kind of thing in Galilee have come to hear Jesus preach. They're there. They hear Jesus tell this paralyzed man his sins are forgiven and now it starts. Right? This is sort of what we're now seeing what it, why Jesus has been so secretive about this stuff. Because they think to themselves why does this man speak blasphemies like this who can forgive sins but God alone? Right? Now you might, you might say, well, they're just being really pious. <laughs> they're just being really pious. Only God can forgive sins. People can't go around. 
forgiving sins. Right? Except remember what we were just saying. Right? How is it in the religious system of the day, according to the scribes, that people get their sins forgiven? They come and they offer animal sacrifices at the temple of Jerusalem. And that's the only way. Right? That's the only way. And um, as we're going to see again in St. Mark's Gospel later, as we already saw in St. Matthew's, when Jesus arrives at the temple, right? these people who do make their pilgrimage down here to Jerusalem, they're not dragging their pet goat, right? <laughs> all, these, all these miles and all these days behind them as they walk down the road right, to Jerusalem. No, they're traveling there and they're buying the goats or the doves or the, the pigeons or, or the sheep that they're going to sacrifice at the temple, right? And then sacrifice them. So there is a, a, a system of wealth going on here Right? and spiritual control going on here with the, the higher-ups at the temple in, in Jerusalem, which we're going to see Jesus gets quite upset about <laughs> when he arrives there and sees how they're exploiting the people. But already here, right, the scribes don't think their motives here are purely religious. <laughs> right? right? There, we can't have people going around forgiving sins because if this guy could just go around forgiving sins, what does that do to our livelihood, <laughs> our business, us as experts, right? They won't need us anymore, right? We'll end up peasants like them, <laughs> which is not what they want, right? So, so their motives are not pure. This is not just a religious issue of does this person or does this person not have the authority to forgive sins. There are a lot of reasons. They're invested in the fact that there's this one system right, for having sins forgiven. Verse 8, But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves. Now that's a quick way of saying Jesus knew what they were thinking. <laughs> right. At least they were polite enough not to say it. <laughs> But Jesus knew what they were thinking. Right? So already we know something about Jesus. Right? He's set up. He's already set up as the Messiah. He's already set up as the king. But now he's also someone who knows what? He knows the thoughts that are in people's hearts. He's someone who has the authority to forgive sins. Right? So we're starting to see hints from St. Mark that there, this, is, this is more than just, you know, the next John Hyrcanus. Right? Who's going to come and unite his people against the Romans. Jesus has a different kind of right, power and authority. So knowing what they're thinking, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk? Right? This is a rhetorical question, but... Right? Which is it easier? Is it easier for me to forgive him his sins, this guy who's paralyzed, or is it easier for me to tell him to get up and walk around? Right? Obviously being, well, it's easier to say at least that his sins are forgiven. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this, say the least. <laughs> right? um, so not only does he tell him to get up and he gets up, but he gets up and picks up the, the, the pallet that they carried him in on and carries it off on them. Right? He goes and leaves with it. Now, part of that we say, well, yeah, obviously they never saw anything like this. This was pretty spectacular. Right? But remember, there were, there were before this, as we've talked about before, there were people who showed up claiming to be the Messiah. There were people who went around claiming to do miracles and heal people. Right? That's not just a modern faith healer thing. Right? <laughs> there were people back then doing it too. But they didn't do things like this. Right? They didn't do things like Jesus is doing, right? It's like the faith healers today, you know, you, you, the faith healers today, you look at the things they claim to heal, a lot of them are really hard to verify, right? Well, I came and saw him and he healed my depression. Well, how do I prove that, right? Or I had chronic pain and now I don't. Well, right, how do I prove that? You don't see people showing up with a missing limb and they're like, look, my arm grew back, right? You don't, <laughs> you don't see that, 
right? You don't see people with leprosy, right, who are missing <laughs> digits and parts of their body showing up now clean and intact, right? You don't see that. You don't see people who have been paralyzed for most of their life jumping up out of their bed and picking up their bed and carrying it with them. So that's what that's indicating. It's not just, wow, that was a pretty good trick, Jesus. Applause, right? (laughs) That's not what they're saying. They're saying the things that Jesus is doing are a whole other level, right? Even be it the people who have showed up claiming to be a Messiah, claiming to be a prophet, claiming to be a healer, right? What Jesus is doing is another thing entirely, right? He's not just another one of them. This is different. This is a unique thing. Verse 13, Then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. Okay, so now, right, he leaves the city, and it's not just that he has trouble going into the city, now he leaves the city and they all follow him. <laughs> right, out into, the, out into the wilderness. They're not going to let him get away again, right? So they all follow him out there, and Jesus teaches it. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Okay. Now we saw this, a similar scene. This, of course, Levi is also known as St. Matthew. Okay. Also known as St. Matthew. It's another one of those, Levi being his Jewish given name, Matthew being the name he used in his profession, which is not a great profession. <laughs> right? we, we don't like people who work for the IRS now. But this is a whole other category, right? This is a whole other category. Because remember, the Romans are the oppressors, right? The Romans are the ones who are ruling over the Judean people by terror, right? And so this Levi and people like him are Judean people by ethnicity, background, and culture who've decided to go and work for the Romans. Decided to go and work for the enemy. But not just the enemy, but remember the enemy that's unclean meaning they've given up, at least to a certain extent, following the Torah at all, right? They've given up the culture, the traditions of their people. They've given up following the law of God in order to work for the Romans. And the way the Romans taxed, remember, was not, there was not a, you know, tax schedule, right? In tax brackets where they said, okay, you owe, you know, 30, 36% based on your income and da-da-da-da-da. It was the Roman governor said, I would like to build a new fill-in-the-blank, <laughs> right? Bathhouse, pagan temple, whatever. To do that, I need X amount of money. He'd say to the, each of the tax collectors, here's how much money I need you to get me. Tax collector's job then, if he wants to keep his life, <laughs> right, is go out and get that much money. Right? However he has to get it from the people. And it doesn't matter if He already got that much last week and the week before and the week before and the week before. He's still got to get it this week. If he has to evict people from their homes, if he has to confiscate their land, if he has to uh, have them sell their wives and children as slaves. Romans don't care as long as they get their money. Tax collector doesn't care. If they refuse to give him the money or refuse to do what he wants them to do, he can call in some Roman soldiers and have them executed. And on top of this, you may wonder, why would someone do this? <laughs> why would someone want to become a tax collector? Right? Seems like kind of a rough profession. Everyone hates you. Why would you do it? Well, because if they raised more money than the governor wanted, they got to keep the rest. Right? So the governor comes and says, I want, you know, 20 talents of silver. They get 40. That's 20 for them. 20 for them. So they're hated, they're hated for a very good reason. Right? These are not moral people. Right? They're not sort of modern civil servants working an honest job for the government. These are, these are a whole different category. Right? These, are, these are traitors to their people. They're thieves. Right? They're extortionists. So Jesus, you know, when he goes and calls these fishermen, right? these fishermen, they're poor, but they're, they're hardy, salt-of-the-earth Galilean people. Right? They're sort of 
good above board Judean people. They're poor, they're a little rough around the edges, not educated, but okay. Right? Now he goes to this Levi person and says, I want you to come and be my descendant. <laughs> right? Whole other thing. Right? Whole other thing. Now to Levi's credit, when Jesus calls him, he gets up and leaves. Right? So he leaves that life, right, his wealth, and all that behind him, to his credit. But still, Jesus now in his inner circle of friends and disciples has this tax collector. Okay. So verse 15, now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house. Now we can just pause there. <laughs> so it's not just he calls him to come and be his disciple. Now he's over eating in his house. Right? He's friends with this guy. Right? He's friends with this guy. That many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. Okay. So they see that Jesus is willing to sit and talk to Levi, right? To treat him with, you know, at least as a human being, not spit at him as he walks by, right? You know, and so they all come and want to talk to Jesus, and Jesus is perfectly happy to talk to all these tax collectors and ne'er do wells and <laughs> right criminals and and sinners who are following him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? Because, of course, according to their interpretation of the Torah, right, you have nothing to do with these people. Right? These people are evil. Right? We pray every day that God will return and visit us and kill all these people, right? get rid of all these people, so that we won't have them in our midst anymore. Right? So that us good people you know, can go through our lives unmolested by people like these tax collectors. Right? We want to get rid of them. Why is... <laughs> why is this teacher of yours... Why is he hanging out with them? Why is he friends with them? Right? All right, Levi leaves his job as a tax collector. Why does not Rome punish him? Well, what does Rome do when a tax collector... Well, they do leaves? after a while. <laughs> True, when they catch up to him, yeah. Than when they catch up to him, well, th there were plenty of other people, right? Remember, Rome, Rome looks at Judeans, right? They're not Roman citizens, right? Meaning legally, legally in Latin, they're non persona, they're non persons. Yes. They're like livestock, right. right? They're they're the creatures that happen to be roaming around this land we own, <laughs> right? That we that we bought. So they don't have a lot invested in any given person. Okay. So to some extent, to some extent, for the individual Jewish peasant, he could kind of, if he could physically get away, he could kind of slip through the cracks, right? I mean, it's not like they had DNA or fingerprints or, right? You know, if you could physically get to another town and say, oh, my name's, you know, Barabbas, right? There, it, there's really no way for anybody to prove you <laughs> to prove you wrong, right? So it would have been very difficult, especially as he starts sort of roaming the countryside with Jesus, you know, for them to find this particular person if they bothered to want to spend the time and the manpower to do it. Right? Now, if they had ever caught up to him and he had ever said, "I'm so and so," right? They probably would have executed. You know, but they, they weren't going to start a manhunt, you know, for for this guy. They just they frankly just didn't care that much, you know, um, to to want to bother with that. He would have had to cause a lot more trouble, right? Now, eventually, Jesus, you know, causes enough trouble that they start a manhunt. Right? They they want to get him, but Matthew isn't isn't that big of a fish uh, in those terms at this point. So verse 17, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay. So Jesus is, is, is uh, fundamentally arguing for a whole different interpretation, a whole different interpretation of God's law than the ones that the scribes and the, the, ones that the, scribes and the Pharisees are using. 
Right? For the scribes and the Pharisees, God's law is there to separate the righteous from the sinners, the good people from the bad people. Right? This is the standard. Right? And then when God comes back to visit his people, he's going to reward the good people, the bad people, right? and then the good people live happily ever after. Right? It's very simple. Right? It's the way a lot of people still think today. It's the way a lot of people still think today. And of course, everybody thinks that they themselves are a good person. Right? <laughs> they all think that they're in the good category. Right? Jesus is saying, that's not the purpose at all. That's not the purpose at all. Then the purpose of God's law right, is not to, tell, to separate good people from bad people. The purpose of God's law is to identify sin like it's a disease. Right? That's why he uses this analogy of a physician. Right? So I identify sin, identify the disease. Why? So that the disease can be cured. Right? So that the disease can be cured. Go back to the leper. What was the Pharisees' answer to this guy has leprosy? Throw him out of the community. So no one else gets leprosy. Right? Whatever happens to him, too bad. It's his fault he got leprosy. Right? It's his own. Right? He probably got it because he's a sinner. Right? Throw him out. Keep the keep the, the remnant pure. Get rid of him. What's Jesus' answer to the man with leprosy? Cure the leprosy. Cure the leprosy. Forgive the sins of the paralytic. Right? So that's the point Jesus is making here, both by what he's doing and now <laughs> visually saying to them, is that God is visiting his people again. It's not to reward the good people and punish the evil people. It's to try to make the evil people good people. Right? Make the evil people. But there's a couple problems there as far as the Pharisees are concerned. Number one, that would require them to admit that they aren't good people. <laughs> right? <laughs> that would require them to, to see themselves as something other than the righteous and perfect and holy people that they know they are. <laughs> right? Deep in their hearts. Right? And it requires them to then accept. Accept these bad people. Right? Now that they've been, now that they've been forgiven. There's a process for the leper, right? Leper goes, strips naked in front of a priest. The priest inspects him. Okay, no leprosy. You're back in. There's no process for a tax collector. Right? No process for the tax collector, for the sinner, for the, the prostitute, right? They're out permanently as far as the Pharisees are concerned. Verse 18 the disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. <laughs> so, now it's not just the Pharisees. <laughs> it's also the people who have been following, say, John the Forerunner, John the Baptist, right? They're all fasting during this period of time. And so they came, they, the Pharisees, came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? See, how, how long has Jesus had a public profile? He's all the way up here in Galilee, right? Pretty far away from the center of power. Just barely starts to get this reputation, and all of a sudden the scribes are coming out of the woodwork. Right? And not coming out of the woodwork to listen and hear what he has to say. Right? Coming out of the woodwork to come and say, hey, right? And they're challenging Jesus, but from their perspective, what Jesus is doing is challenging them, right? and their authority, right, as the as the leaders. So they come and say, "Okay, hey, we're fasting. Why why aren't your disciples fasting? Right? You're feasting. You're going out and eating. In fact, you're eating with those tax collectors. Right? It's even worse. But you know, why are you eating in the first place?" Jesus said to them, "Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast." But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, 
The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. So he uses a bunch of metaphors there that don't seem to have anything to do with each other. Right? His first, his first metaphor, he talks about the friends of the bridegroom don't fast while the bridegroom is with them. Well, that's what? That's leading up to the wedding. Right? Leading up to the wedding, bridegroom, he's going to get married. Right? And then he and his wife, once they get married, are going to go off and start their life together. They didn't really have honeymoons <laughs> in the first century, but they're going to go off and start their life together. Right? And, and, and as, as anybody knows who's had a friend get married, right? once they get married, they're not hanging around with you right? as much as they used to. Right? Now they're off with their wife starting their lives together. So he's saying, right, while the bridegroom's friends, while the wedding's approaching, they don't fast. Right? They're going out having a good time with their friend. Right? They're, they're planning the bachelor party because in a little while, he's going to go off and be married and they're not going to be able to have any fun anymore. Once he's married, then they'll, you know, fast and, and, and take care of the other things. But while he's there, while they're waiting for the wedding, they're going to celebrate, right? Enjoy their time with them. So th- this metaphor is, works pretty well, right? <laughs> because he's, Jesus is saying about the disciples, right? The time's going to come when I'm going to be gone, and then they'll fast, right? And then they'll, they'll take care of business. But now while I'm here, right, now's the time to, to celebrate. Right? That was the time to celebrate. Because he's returning to that idea again of God returning to visit his people. Right? If God in, in Jesus is returning to visit his people, then yeah, the people should be celebrating. Right? <laughs> people should be celebrating. They should be fasting. Okay? So then the, these other metaphors are a little more confusing. First one, you don't put new cloth into an old garment. Right? Well, that's saying, like, if I... If I tear a hole in my knee and my pants right? and I go to Walmart and I buy a brand new piece of black fabric and I sew that piece in there as soon as I wash it right, that cloth's never been washed before, it's going to shrink my pants have been washed before they're not right? so it's just going to tear again right? when, the, when the new cloth shrinks <laughs> the first time it's going gonna, it's gonna to rip a hole right? and then the next metaphor afterwards same kind of thing you don't take an old wineskin that's been used before that's dry, right, that's dried out, and try and put new wine into it, right, because the new wine is going gonna, gonna to break the, right, the old leather, right. So what's he saying? He's saying, we just came off of, right, Christ is doing, Jesus is doing something new, right, that hasn't been done before, right, hasn't been done before. He's talking to the Pharisees now. Pharisees are watching him do it. What are they doing? They're balking. Right? You can't do that. Right? You can't do that. You need to do things the way we do things. Right? You need to do things the way we need to do things. And so what Jesus is saying to them with these other two metaphors is, right, he addresses, the first metaphor is addressing the topic. Why aren't they fasting? These other two metaphors, he's saying to the Pharisees, right, the, the structures you have Right? The way you think about this, the way you think about sins being forgiven, the way you think about sinners and tax collectors, the way you think about uh, fasting, right? all, all of your religious practice and everything, those structures can't hold, right? can't hold the new thing that I'm bringing. Right? You're not going to be able to understand in your current mindset Right from the frame of reference you have now, you're not going to be able to understand what I'm doing. Okay, he's saying to them, "You've already come to me with a few of these questions now, <laughs> right? either spoken or unspoken. You come to me with a few of these questions, right? You're not getting it, right? You're not getting. It. You're going to have to abandon the way you're thinking about things now, right, in order to understand what it is that I'm doing." You're not going to be able to understand it in your own terms. Okay, I'm not. He's not going to play by their rules. Right? I'm not going to. I'm not going to do this the way you think I ought to do this. Right? And so what he's doing is like the new fabric or the new wine, and they're like the old, <laughs> the old wines. Get the old, right? They can't receive it. Right? They can't receive it without themselves what being made new themselves being made new, which is what he's doing for the tax collectors and the sinners 
he was forgiving, they're being made new. The Pharisees need to be made new also. Right? They need to be made new also, but they won't accept that. They won't accept that they're the dry old wineskin or they're the torn cloth. <laughs> right? Because they're they're perfect. They're clean. They're intact, as far as they're concerned. Okay. Verse 23, Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Now look, they just pop up like whack-a-moles now. <laughs> they're walking through a field. Right? They're just walking through a field. <laughs> Pharisees. <laughs> right? Why? Well, because they're following him around. Right? You saw the people followed him out of the city. Well, they're not the only ones. The Pharisees are following him around. Right? And again, they're not following him around like the crowds are to hear what he has to say. Right? They're following him, keeping an eye on him. Right? Oh, we caught you again. <laughs> right? they're, walking, they're walking through a wheat field. They're picking some grain, eating the grain. It's the Pharisees and the scribes. Yeah. <laughs> They're, they're, right, they're following him around and keeping an eye on him. Here they come again. Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now notice here, it doesn't say they came up to Jesus' disciples and said, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Then you come up to Jesus and say, why do your disciples? They said, look! So who are they talking to? They're not talking to Jesus anymore. <laughs> right? Jesus' last answer <laughs> they ended up with that, right? They're just talking to all the other people and saying, look, look at what they're doing. Why are they doing what it's not lawful to do, right, to the crowd? Okay. Verse 25, but he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and ate the shewbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with them. So, he refers back now. Remember, we talked about the, sort of this theme in Mark, right? Remember, when David was on the run from Saul. He and his men didn't have any food. Right? They came to Shiloh, where the uh, tabernacle was. Right? They needed food. Well, there was the shoe bread, right? The bread in the tabernacle that was eaten by the priests. Right? The priest gave it to David and to the disciples to eat, right? to the people with him. So, by analogy, right? who is Jesus in this analogy? David. Right? And the disciples are his men. Right? So remember, David, king of Judah, the Messiah, is his descendant. So Jesus has just sort of let slip, <laughs> Right? who he is and what he's doing. And he's just compared himself to David and his disciples to David's men, <laughs> right, who are on the run. Who does that make the Pharisees and the scribes? Saul, Saul. <laughs> right? And the persecutors. Again, not a nice metaphor for them, <laughs> right? But identifies who he is. In verse 27, And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So there's two pieces there. First, Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Again, Jesus is changing the way in which they look at the law of God. Right? Because the way they look at the law of God is keeping the Sabbath. This is one of the Ten Commandments. Right? This is the Fourth Commandment. So people who keep the Fourth Commandment and keep the Sabbath, good people, <laughs> right? People who break the Sabbath, bad people, <laughs> right? Bad people, worthy of death, right? Worthy of death. And when God comes and straightens things out, those people who don't keep the Sabbath, those Sabbath breakers are out of here, right? Well, is Jesus saying God's law is to be interpreted, right? He's saying, right, God made the Sabbath for man. God put a day of rest in seven for human beings. Right? God cares about it. God isn't, here's my standard I'm looking to, right? Do not cross this line. Oh, you cross the line. Bang. Right? <laughs> That's not what God's doing. Especially with the Sabbath. God's saying, 
you need one day out of seven. He made us so he knows. <laughs> right? he said, you need one day, at least one day out of seven where you rest. Where you rest. Right? And, and, and he knew darn well, and especially back in the Bronze Age, he couldn't just make that a suggestion. Right? <laughs> if he just said, I, I suggest that you let all of the people who work for you and all of your slaves rest one day in seven. Right? That they would have said, well, that's a nice suggestion, but I got money to make and crops to harvest, and, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it wasn't a suggestion, it was a command. Right? But what Jesus is saying then is that the commands of God are made for the good of human beings. Right? That the reason God gives these commandments is he wants, he loves human beings, he wants them to prosper. He wants them, again, to use the physician metaphor, to be healthy. He wants them to be healthy. He loves them. And so, right? And so, he gives these commandments to help them do that. Right? The way my mom made me eat broccoli, right? I didn't want to eat broccoli, but my mom made me eat broccoli. Not because she hated me and wanted me to eat horrible broccoli, wanted to torture me with food I didn't like, right? But because it was healthy, right? Because it was healthy. And it was good for me, whether I liked it or not. Right? And so, the same kind of thing is at work. That's fundamentally different. So a Sabbath breaker for Jesus is, again, an unhealthy person. Right? Somebody who's so driven and focused on money, right, or success or whatever it is they're chasing after, that they have to work seven days a week. Right? They can't sit down and rest. Right? Somebody who's that driven is an unhealthy person. Is a person who's destroying themselves. Right? It is not good for them. Right? And so God commands that they rest. Right? That they trust him on that seventh day. That you know what? If you don't work that seventh day, I'm going to take care of I will make sure you have the money you need. I will make sure you have what you need. Right? So Jesus is fundamentally, again, changing what the law is for. Right? And so then the second part is, Therefore, the Son of Man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. Right? Son of Man referring to who? Himself. <laughs> Himself. Right? God made this for, for mankind. Right? And therefore, this is a hint again. Well, wait, what does that mean? He's a human being, so he's Lord of the Sabbath? Right? This is another one of the hints right? that St. Mark is dropping that Jesus is more than just right human king. Right? Because David wasn't Lord of the Sabbath. Right? Okay, we'll do a little. So chapter 3. And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Right? So again, right? Jesus goes into the synagogue to teach. Are they waiting to hear what he's going to say? Gee, I wonder how he's going to interpret the scroll of Isaiah to us this morning. Right? No, it's the Sabbath. And they see this guy with the with their hands like, oh, this has been going around healing people. I wonder if he's going to heal that guy on the Sabbath. Let's watch. Right, let's watch so we can come after him again. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or do evil, to save life or to kill? <laughs> right? So he, again, he, he, he changes the category. He says, is it lawful? Right? According to the law, if I'm going to follow the law of God about the Sabbath, then on the Sabbath, should I do good or should I do evil? Right? Trick question. Because from their point of view, right, you're not supposed to do anything. <laughs> you're supposed to do nothing on the, on the Sabbath. But what are they going to say? No, it's not lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Right? <laughs> right? It's also interesting the way he frames it. He doesn't say, is it, he implies that it's, even if he'd waited until the next day to heal the man with the withered hand, that would actually be evil. 
not just. Oh, yeah, because he commits. In other words, not healing the man is evil. It's not just morally neutral. There is no moral right. neutral. Right, to save life or to kill. Yeah. In other words, if I don't heal him, I'm murdering him. If I ignore, you're right, if I ignore him, yeah. right, if I ignore his plight and his sickness, <laughs> right, is how is that lawful on the Sabbath, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But they kept silent, because, of course, they're not going <laughs> to. They're not going to fall. Uh, no, it's wrong to do good. Well, wait. It's bad to do good. Uh, so they just keep their mouth shut. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. Right? Because, again, Jesus knows what they're thinking. Right? Why is Jesus angry? Why is he grieved at them? Because he knows what they're thinking. He knows they're not sitting there going, oh, Jesus makes a good point. They probably should heal that man on the Sabbath. Right? They're just sitting there going, oh, you got the best of it there, we can't say anything. That no good. Right? Right? He's come here. What is what has Jesus done since the beginning of the gospel? Right? We know he's taught, but notice St. Mark hasn't told us anything he's taught. At least in any detail. It said he preached the gospel of the kingdom. That's the closest we've gotten to a description of what he was preaching. Right? He doesn't go into what it is he's teaching. He's casting demons out of people, he's healing people, he's forgiving people's sins. Right? Why on earth would you be mad about that? Right? I would just step back, right? Cultural stuff aside, historical stuff aside. Somebody shows up, right? Somebody walks into Memorial Hospital today, right? Goes around, gets everybody out of their beds and healthy. Right? Doctors check them out, they're fine, and send them home. Who's going to show up and be ticked? Maybe the people from the HMO. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know who's who's going to show up and be mad about that? Right? This is, this is all good stuff here. Right? They should be thankful. They should be rejoicing. Right? They should be saying, hey, look, finally, God has returned to his people. Here's our Messiah. He's healing our sick. Right? <laughs> this is wonderful. Right? But what are they doing? They're following him around. That guy, right? <laughs> Why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? Why is he doing this? Their hearts are hard. They don't care about anybody. Right? They care about their own power. They care about their own wealth. They care about enforcing their own rules to which are tied their power and their wealth. But they don't care about these people. Right? These are the leaders and the rulers of these people. And they don't care about these people. One lick. They don't care about their sickness. They don't care about this man's withered hand. They don't care about the guy being paralyzed. They, they, they don't want to do anything to try and reconcile these tax collectors and sinners back to God. Right? They just want to be rid of them. Right? That's why Jesus gets mad here, finally. It's not just that they're giving him a hard time. <laughs> and he gets mad. It's that they, just, they don't care about anybody. Right? They don't care about anybody except themselves and their own, their own power. So he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. <laughs> right? So is the response to even this? Wow, that's amazing. Right? Do we even get the golf clap and the no. Right? Not only do they decide we need to get this guy, right? We need to get rid of him. But notice who they go to. The Herodians. Right? Meaning Herod and his people. Who are the people who, other than the tax collectors of the Romans, they pretty much hate most of the world. Right? Why? Because there's another big group of collaborators with the Romans. Right? These are their rivals for power. <laughs> These are people they don't like. But you know who they don't like more than they don't like the Herodians? Jesus. <laughs> right? Jesus. They've got a common enemy. Because Jesus is a threat to them. And Herod, going around calling himself the king of the Jews. <laughs> right? He's the Messiah. He's a threat to Herod, too. So we can come together on this one. So again, this is like the, the, the Bernie Sanders supporters and the Donald Trump supporters. Right? 
all getting together, right? All getting together to go to go take somebody out, right? They got nothing in common except. <laughs> so this is this is the, the warring party. So this shows you, right? Again, why why right from the beginning was Jesus being secretive? Well, how long did it take? <laughs> right? How long did it take once the Pharisees got wind of what he was doing for them to decide he needed to die? Right? He needs to die. Not very long. Verse 7, but Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. So Jesus pulls back again. Right? He goes out by the Sea of Galilee on the seashore. Right? But what happens? A great multitude from Galilee followed him. And from Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and beyond the Jordan and those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude. Okay. So now his reputation is spread beyond Galilee. Right? There's people coming up from Judea and Jerusalem to see him. There's people coming from Tyre and Sidon, which is over here on the seacoast. Right? Idumea is down here. That's where Herod's actually originally from. Right? They're coming from down here. So from this whole area, they're all now coming to Galilee to see Jesus. How far a distance is that? Uh, it's probably like from, from Capernaum to Idumea is probably about 600 miles. So, yeah. <laughs> this is all by foot. Right, the people are coming. It wasn't like you were just going over the next city because you heard there was something big going on. No, this is not like walking downtown. This is like if you decided to walk to uh, San Francisco, right? <laughs> because there was something, <laughs> you know. Okay, so they're coming from all around now. There how many things he was doing came to him. So he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude lest they should crush him. <laughs> so they're out on the seashore they're all streaming up there he says have a boat ready in case we need to <laughs> right, head out in the water to get away from this from this mob. For he healed many so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him and the unclean spirits whenever they saw him fell down before him and cried out saying you are the son of God but he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. So we see this continuing with the demons. The demons all know who he is and are all scared. <laughs> right? he, doesn't even, he doesn't even have to go and, you know, cast them out. Just they see him and they, the demons flip out. <laughs> right? And, and, uh, and take off. So what that really is saying is people Right. Right. The ugly spirits are in people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the demons are in people, but it's, it's the point is he's not even having to sort of drive them out, just they see him and flee. <laughs> right? They see him and run, right? But they, they also are aware of who he is, right? So Jesus is telling them, commanding them not to, right? Not to. He, he doesn't need them as witnesses, <laughs> right? That's, that's not. And we talked last time about um, the point St. James makes in his epistle about this, when he's talking about what faith is. Right, and he says this is this is why faith isn't just you know checking true false you know, true, you know Jesus is the Son of God true, right? <laughs> Jesus is the Messiah true. He's like the demons know that they don't just believe it's true. The demons all know that's true, right? That's not what faith is, right? He talks about faith it is reflected in your actions and how you live your life, right? If you really believe Jesus is the Son of God, if you really believe Jesus is the Messiah, then that's going to change how you live your life. But just giving a sentence saying, oh yeah, that's true. Well, the demons do that. <laughs> right. Okay, so verse 13, He went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. And they came to him. Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. And to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges. That's a great uh, Greek name. If you if you, you have a kid or a grandkid, and you need to suggest a name. <laughs> we haven't baptized a Boanerges anytime. <laughs> so you can call him Bo for short, you know. But. <laughs> that's, uh, 
Boanerges, that is Sons of Thunder, uh, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, and they went into a house. There's a sort of a spoiler mixed in there. <laughs> right? In case you didn't know what was coming next. Oh yeah, Judas, yeah, he's the one who's going to be a traitor. But, um, so we saw, um, we've already seen a few of these people be called. Remember, Simon and Andrew got called in chapter 1, and uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and we saw Levi, Matthew get called. But now he specifically, at this point, sort of organizes the 12. Right? These are his inner circle, or these 12. And notice what, what they do. Right? We sometimes have this image that sort of the 12 disciples just sort of followed Jesus around and like watched, <laughs> and watched what he was doing. You know, or that he told them, watch this closely because at least four of you are going to write this down later. Right? That's, that wasn't right. what was going on. He appoints these twelve and what do they do? They participate in what he's doing. Right? What has Jesus been doing so far? Well, he's been traveling around, he's been teaching, he's been healing the sick, and he's been casting out demons. Well, what does it say the twelve do? Right? He sent them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and cast out demons. Right? So they're, they're continuing what he's doing. They're working under it. There's executive vice presidents or whatever, right? They're, they're working under him, but participating in what he's doing. Right? Notice also, it doesn't say, and, the, and 11 of them participated in what he was doing, but that Judas guy, we knew he was a bad apple right from the start, so we didn't send him, right? Or it doesn't say, and Judas, since he was the one who was going to betray him, when he tried to cast out demons, it didn't work. Right? It doesn't say that either. Right? All 12 of them are going out and doing this. Judas along with the other 11. As I said when we were in St. Matthew's Gospel, wouldn't it stink to have been one of the people baptized by Judas? But, <laughs> but, but he was out there doing it along with them. Right? He was out there doing it along with them. Right? And even though St. Mark has leaked, <laughs> you know, it's spoiled, it told us he's going to betray him, he doesn't say Judas knew at this point he was going to betray him. You sometimes have this picture of Judas, like the whole time he's falling him around, kind of like this, <laughs> you know, like rubbing his hands together, like oh, I'm the bad one, right? <laughs> you know, he, he was not identical. The other eleven and him, right, were of a piece. Jesus treated him just the same. Gave him all the power and authority he gave to the other eleven. Right? And this is going to be important when we get to the end and talk. When we get to the end of Mark and talk more about Judas as we saw in Matthew, that, that uh, it's embedded deeply in all of the Gospels that uh, just because someone says they're a follower of Jesus, and even if they go around doing miracles, <laughs> preaching, they're in a position of authority, that doesn't necessarily mean they're the real deal. <laughs> Not so that we walk around being suspicious of other people like the Pharisees are here, but so that we look at ourselves. Right? So that we look at ourselves. So that we don't develop a false confidence in, well, you know, I have this, I'm a priest. I was ordained. You know, I got this date. I got a certificate from the Archdiocese. It's on my wall. You can see it. It's got a shiny little gold seal. Right? So that's my e ticket to heaven, right? <laughs> that means I'm, I'm a holy special. No. <laughs> no. In fact, I've got more responsibility, and so I'm probably more likely to end up in hell than anybody right we'll see as we go on that <laughs> it turns in that direction but we saw we saw that in St. Matthew's gospel right the parable of the sheep and the goats right they come up to Jesus and say well Jesus when did we see you sick and hungry and poor they're not people who don't know who Jesus is right these aren't a bunch of heathens right who never knew who Jesus was who come and say well by the way who are you right <laughs> they all know Jesus they all know who he is they'll say well Jesus when did we see you sick and hungry and tired and tired these are all people who knew full well who Jesus was. They just hadn't followed him in their lives. Right? So we'll, we'll see that as we go forward. I'm teasing the way, you know, spoiling the way Matt, Mark, St. Mark's will. Okay. But so he appoints them, he sends out, they're, partic they're active participants in what Jesus is doing. 
Verse 20, Then the multitude came together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. Meaning, right, the disciples of Jesus, they got such a big crowd, all crowding around, all wanting to be healed, right, all wanting to touch Jesus, all wanting to talk to Jesus. They can't even take a lunch break, guys, can we, <laughs> right, can we take five and sit down and eat a second, right? So they're just jammed. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. What does that mean, his own people? Right? This is Jesus' family. Right? His relatives. These are the folks from Nazareth. Right? They, hear, they hear about all this stuff going on with Jesus, and they're like, oh man, he must have lost his mind. Right? He's going around telling people he's the Messiah. He's going around claiming to heal people. Oh man. He grew up down the street from me. Right? <laughs> he was my next door neighbor. He must have lost his mind. Right? We need to go get him. We need to go sit him down, <laughs> right? have a talk with him before he causes any more trouble. Right. Verse 22, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem <laughs> still hanging around. <laughs> right? Still hanging around. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he cast out demons. Okay. They've got an explanation. That's how he's cast out demons. He's demon possessed himself. Right? And he's just possessed by a bigger demon. <laughs> right? Than them. And so the big demon that's possessed him is, is kicking out the, the smaller demons that are possessing these other people. That's how it's working. Right? That's why, why he could do this thing. Just so you know, Beelzebub. Uh, is literally. Uh, in Aramaic, Lord of the Flies. It comes from one of the titles of the pagan god from the Old Testament, Baal or Baal. Uh, one of his titles was Baal Zabul. Baal Zabul means something like High Lord Baal. Right? The bull and Baal are the same root. So it's sort of like, <laughs> and Baal means Lord, so it's like the High Lord Baal, that's what his worshippers would call him. So the, the, the Jewish people kind of changed the name to Lord of the Flies. Now why would you call him Lord of the Flies? You've got to remember, these are farmers. So if you're a farmer and you're out in your field, right, on the average day, working with cattle, working with oxen, where would you find large congregations of flies? More common than dead things. Manure, <laughs> dung, right? The animal dung, right? So this is a this name is a shot at Baal. Right? <laughs> they changed it. So the idea is, you know, Lord of the Flies, where all the flies congregate to quote unquote worship is at the dung, right? But so they accuse Jesus, right? Prince of demons, right? Baal, the big bad guy. Right? If you have a spiritual bad guy in the Old Testament, it's Baal. Right? He's the, the enemy Canaanite God. So that's who Jesus is possessed by Baal. That's why he can command all these lower ranking demons because they're lower ranking. Right? So he called them to himself and said to them in parables. Right? He called them to himself. What does that mean? The scribes are going around saying this about Jesus. Right? To the people. Again, they're not talking to Jesus. They don't come up to Jesus and say, hey Jesus, we think you have a demon possession problem. Right? <laughs> they're going to the people and saying, this is what he's doing. Right? So Jesus calls the scribes over to himself. Right? Jesus once again knows what they're up to and says, <laughs> right, come here. So he says to the scribes, how can Satan cast out Satan? Obvious flaw in your theory, right? How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end, right? So he's kind of saying, well, that would be, actually be nice, actually, because if Satan got into a fight <laughs> with the other demons, then that would kind of wreck Satan's whole kingdom, right? They'd 
have some kind of civil war and wipe themselves out, right? Well, that'd be nice, right? But your theory sort of doesn't make sense, right? Because Satan and his demons are all on the same page. Right? So if Jesus was possessed by Satan, why would he be going around casting out his own minions, right? Who <laughs> are supposedly doing his work, right? So this theory doesn't make sense. Verse 27, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Well, what does that mean? This is Jesus telling them what he's actually doing. He says, if I'm going to go rob your house, and you're a big guy, <laughs> you're a big physically strong guy, I'm going to go rob you, right? I'm, I can't just walk in and start grabbing your stuff. Right? <laughs> if I walk in and start grabbing your stuff, you're going to punch me out, right? I'm not going to get very far in my that. But if I sneak up on you, right? If I sneak up on you, I get the drop on you, and I tie you up, then when you're tied up, I can go and steal all your stuff, and you can't do anything. Right? So he's making the same argument about Satan. Right? What does Satan know in this metaphor? Satan owns these people. Right? These people who are demon-possessed. Right? These people who are sinners, these people who are tax collectors, these people who are sick, right? And by the way, you scribes too. But <laughs> Satan has possession of them. So if Satan has possession of them, and Jesus wants to take them back. He wants to set them free from Satan. What does he got to do first? He's got to bind Satan, right? He's got to go and bind Satan, and then once he's bound Satan, then he can loot, right? He can take back what Satan what Satan has taken. Right? And this, of course, is the imagery we're going to see in a couple of years here when we get to the book of Revelation, right, where it talks about Satan being bound. Right? This is also the imagery that we have if you've ever looked closely at the resurrection icon right, that we have on Pascha. Right? There's a, Jesus is standing on the gates of hell that he kicked down. Right? And down below, there's this figure down in the dark who's chained up. Right? That's Satan. Right? That's Satan. And then what is Jesus doing? He's grabbing Adam and Eve. Right? He's grabbing the saints of the Old Testament. He's taking them with him. Right? Getting out of there. Right? So that icon is an image of what Jesus is saying here, the metaphor that Jesus is using here, about what he's doing. Remember we talked last time about how the word we translate gospel, Evangelion, in, in the ancient world was used uh, to describe a military victory, right? Well, here's where we get at pretty close to the beginning, right? We're only in chapter three, right? St. Mark tips the hat of who it is that Jesus is battling, right? Jesus has been consecrated as king. Now who is he battling in order to take the throne? Satan, right? Satan. But now to take the next step, if Satan is the one who has possession of these people, right, who does that make the Pharisees and the scribes and the, uh, the chief priests who are running the temple and who are in authority in Jerusalem? Who are they working for? They're working for Satan. <laughs> right? They're working for Satan. That's why they don't care about the people. <laughs> That's why they're defrauding the people. That's why they're not healing them. And so he is saying, right, it says he called the scribes over to him, spoke to them in parables. Well, <laughs> this is why he's telling it to them in parables. Because if he just straight out said, hey, you guys came here from Satan. <laughs> right? They've come and said, you, you're possessed by Satan. He says, uh, shoes on the other foot here. Shoes on the other foot here. I'm here battling Satan you're here battling me right what does that mean right what does that mean that means you're on his side verse 28 assuredly I say to you all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may utter but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. Yeah. So, 
This is sometimes referred to as the unforgivable sin. <laughs> as people interpret it. Because Jesus is saying, anything you do, any blasphemy you say against God, you can get forgiven except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. There's no forgiveness for that. Why does he say that? Because they said he had an unclean spirit. So what's he saying? They've come to Jesus who, what? We saw at his baptism. What's the spirit that dwells within Jesus? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. And these scribes have come and called that spirit, what? Satan. Right? They said that God and the power of God is the devil. Is Satan. That would be why that can't be forgiven. If you identify God as Satan, right, if God is your adversary, right, you set yourself in enmity against God, right? Why can't that be forgiven? Because God can't forgive you against your will, right? By definition, you're not going to be asking for God's forgiveness because he's your enemy. So Jesus is saying to them, if you continue the way you are now, you've made God your enemy. You've set up God as your enemy. If you live and die with God as your enemy, right, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing after this life for you but condemnation. If God is your enemy. Okay. Notice though, we need to remind ourselves, he tells them this. Right? He doesn't go to the disciples, right? And they're like, man, those scribes were here again talking trash on you, Jesus. <laughs> right? And Jesus says, well, don't worry about them. They're all going to hell, right? <laughs> that's, that's not what transpires here, right? They're coming and saying this horrible blasphemy against Jesus. And Jesus calls them over and does what? And warns them, right? Warns them. You've set yourself up. You've taken Satan's side. You've set yourself up as God's enemy. You've taken Satan's side. You live and die like this, you're going to end up where Satan ends up. <laughs> right? So the fact that he's telling them this, the fact that he called them over and told them this is what? It's a chance for them to repent. Right? It's a chance for them to accept, you know, what he's saying is right. And we're in the wrong. And the change. As we know, unfortunately, not a lot of the Pharisees and scribes are going but some are. St. Paul was a Pharisee. Right? Nicodemus. So he does get through to some of them. Right? But the fact is, he cares even about them. You know, these people who are blaspheming him, these people who are plotting to kill him. And remember, we've already been shown, he knows what they think. So he knows they're plotting to kill him. Right? But he's still... Right? Calls them over and warns them. Verse 31. We now go back to, remember, the people from Nazareth who showed up? <laughs> now that we've dealt with the scribes. His brothers and his mother came, and standing out that side, they sent to him, calling him. Right? Like, Come over here, Jeff. <laughs> right? Jesus, we need to have a talk. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. <coughs> but he answered them saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Sometimes, <laughs> some of our, our Protestant brothers and sisters especially, like to quote this verse, uh, especially regarding uh, the Lord's mother, right? The Theotokos is saying, oh, see, Jesus is saying she's not special. Right? Jesus is saying she's not special. Okay. Is that what Jesus is saying? Does Jesus actually say anything about his mother and his brothers here? Not really. <laughs> right? He just uses that as a point of departure. Right? What is his point? His point is, you here who are my disciples, right? you here who, who hear the word of God and, and do it, right? you who follow me, you are a family. Right? That's what he's saying. Right? You're my mother and my sisters and my brother. Right? This is a family, is what he's saying. He's not saying anything about them. 
right? In fact, by extension, if his actual mother does the will of God, right, and follows him, then she is, right, part of that family, right? And his brothers and his sisters, right? But the point he's making is that uh, the, the, uh, that our, our uh, genetic relationships, what we call genetic relationships, right? Family relationships are not as important and are not as real right, as the faith we share with one another. Right? It's the faith we share with one another. Right? And remember, this is, he's talking to a group of people who put huge stock in genealogies, right? going all the way back. Right? Messiah has to be descended from David, priests have to be descended from Levi. Right? It's all based on these family structures. Family authority structures. Jesus is saying, "No, you, you're a family, right? If if you uh, if you follow me, so this isn't a comment, positive or negative, about Saint James, <laughs> right, or the Theotokos, or Saint Jude, or any of the others. It's a taking off point to say, this is a family. We're a family." In the same way that if I stand in front of the church on Sunday in a sermon and I say, us here, we're a family, right? I'm not saying I'm disowning my sister who lives in Minnesota, right? (laughs) I'm not saying she's cut off. You people are my real family, right? (laughs) It's not implied, right? I'm just saying we together are a church family. That's what what Jesus is, is saying. Okay. Well, I probably, we're at the end of a chapter and I've probably prattled on long enough for this evening. So we'll pick up next Sunday, Lord willing, here at the beginning of chapter 4. We actually got through two whole chapters in one week. <laughs> it's a new speed record. So thank you everybody.